A beam of electric light pierces the darkness over the calm waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The Titanic is quietly making its way through the waves, its passengers asleep, when suddenly a monstrous white shape is caught in the light beam. The fateful iceberg is about to rend the side of the legendary ship. April 14, 1912, only two days before someone will take a photo of a giant iceberg with a pretty unusual elliptical shape. It turns out that this iceberg most likely formed out of snow that fell 100,000 years ago. Researchers use computer modeling to figure out its origin. They used data from 1912 and added some new information about winds and ocean currents. They concluded that the iceberg was probably a part of a small cluster of glaciers in southwest Greenland. These days, it's possible to calculate the roots of such icebergs in any given year in the past. So the infamous chunk of ice was on its way from Greenland to an area further south from Cornwall. If the ship had passed through that region only two days later, the iceberg would have moved far away from the point where they met. At first, the weight of the most well-known iceberg in the world was 75 million tons. With time, it started to slowly melt away. And when it sank the Titanic, its weight was only 1.5 million tons. By the time of the collision, it had probably been melting for months. But it was still a true monster. When the Titanic sank, the iceberg was 400 feet long, and more than 100 feet of its surface was above the water. Some people believe it was a supermoon that caused the Titanic to sink. That night, there was a rare lunar event. It hadn't happened for 1,400 years. In normal conditions, the iceberg wouldn't have traveled so far south without melting and losing the largest part of its mass. But the supermoon could have been the reason for an unusually high tide that pulled the iceberg away from the glacier way faster than usual. There's a specific type of bacteria that slowly consumes the remains of the Titanic. Salt corrosion, ocean currents, freezing temperatures, plus this rust-eating microorganism might consume the entire wreckage. American actress Dorothy Gibson was aboard the Titanic. She survived, and when she arrived in New York, she started filming a movie called Saved from the Titanic almost right away. The movie was released only a month after the Titanic sank, and in the movie, she even wore the same shoes and clothes she had during the actual disaster. The movie was a big success at that time, but the only known copy was destroyed in a fire. 14 years before the Titanic sank, a novella called Futility had been published, and it seemed to have predicted the whole event. The plot centered around a fictional ship called the Titan that sank during its voyage. The Titan was almost the same size as Titanic, and they both went to the bottom in April. The reason was hitting an iceberg, too. Both the real and fictional ships were described as unsinkable, and both of them had the legally required number of lifeboats, which, as it turned out later, were nowhere near enough. We've seen it in the movie, but there were some real-life love stories happening on the Titanic, too. Thirteen couples even took a trip on the Titanic as part of their honeymoon. One of the couples owned Macy's department store in New York. Once it became clear the Titanic was rapidly sinking, the woman refused to go into a lifeboat without her husband. But he didn't want to join her while there were still women and children who he thought had to go first. Then his wife gave her coat to her maid. She insisted that the maid should get into the lifeboat, and she wanted her to be warm. As for the woman herself, she decided to stay with her husband till the end. Some people believe Titanic sank because of a mummy, not an iceberg. It all started around 1000 BCE with a mysterious woman who lived in Egypt, in the city of Thebes. People knew little about her, but they called her a priestess. Her mummy was put in a wooden sarcophagus and covered with a large lid with the image of her face and some mystical inscriptions. This place had been hidden until the first half of the 19th century when a group of locals accidentally came across it. 
they disturbed her peace. No one knows how, but the mummy disappeared that day without a trace. A couple of decades later, a group of rich friends from England traveled to Egypt and found the empty mummy casket with the image of the priestess, whose dark eyes seemed to be looking into the void. They decided to buy it, but the buyer disappeared the same night before he even got the case. All members of the group had some accidents. The casket changed its location a couple of times until it, as some believe, ended up on the Titanic. It took more than 70 years for a robot submarine to find the ruins of this legendary ship. The wreck lies nearly 13,000 feet under the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, split into two halves. Why did the liner break apart? No one knows exactly. Some think it happened because of the water that got inside when the ship collided with the iceberg. The pressure was so powerful it separated two parts of the vessel, starting with the ship's bottom structure. Others say it was because of the hull rivets. They had a high concentration of slag or smelting residue. And that's something that can cause the metal to split apart. The ship generally had many flaws, starting with the design. The watertight bulkheads weren't completely sealed on top. This allowed the water to flow between the compartments and, in the end, sink the vessel. The iron of the ship's rivets and steel of the hull ended up ruined because of high sulfur content, cold temperatures, and high speeds. The steel shattered and the rivets popped out quite easily. Because of this, Titanic sank 24 times faster than it would have otherwise. If the ship had hit the iceberg head-on instead of ramming it with its side, it would have probably stayed afloat. How come the crew members didn't have binoculars? It would have surely helped them spot the iceberg on time and maybe even avoid the disaster. But the binoculars on the Titanic were locked in a storage cabinet. Only one crew member had the key, and he had been transferred off the ship right before it set sail. He later said he hadn't remembered to hand over the key. But even without the binoculars, the ship might have had some time to change course and avoid the collision if the crew had gotten some warning. But that's the thing. Someone did warn them. About an hour before the incident, a ship that was relatively close to Titanic, the SS Californian, sent a message to inform them it had stopped because of dense ice field. But the warning never got to the Titanic's captain. Some experts say it was because the radio operator didn't think it was that urgent. And later, the SS Californian said they didn't get a call for help from the Titanic because their radio operator was off-duty. Some say the crew on the Titanic couldn't spot the iceberg on time because of an optical illusion. Atmospheric conditions that night probably caused super refraction which could have camouflaged the berg. After all, no one actually saw the iceberg until it was too close to the ship to somehow avoid the crash. Not even a whole minute passed between the moment they saw the iceberg and the collision. It was only 37 seconds. And it took Titanic 2 hours and 40 minutes to disappear below the ocean's waves. Once a famous giant, the largest ship of that time. Now two grand pieces lying on the ocean bottom about 2,000 feet apart, torn by the catastrophic collision of time itself. The stern of the Titanic got completely ruined after hitting the ocean floor. But you can still recognize the bow since many interiors were left preserved. There's a type of bacteria found on the ship's rusticles. A rusticle is this brownish formation of rust. It occurs deep underwater when the wrought iron the ship is made of oxidizes. It means the bacteria eat the iron of the Titanic's hull, piece by piece. And it seems they might finish their snack by 2030, way sooner than when anyone would expect the wreck to be gone forever. You may think it would probably be easier to take the wreck out of the water so that we got to keep it, but it would fall apart if anyone tried to do that. It's been in the water for more than 110 years now and is now so rusty that no one would be able to reconstruct some parts even if we managed to get the ship out of the ocean depths. What do you think? Could any of about 700 people that had survived the sinking of the Titanic hear it hit the ocean bottom? 
The largest ship that had ever been made till then disappeared literally before their eyes after all. But sound most likely wouldn't have traveled from water to air. We can't hear that well in water because our bodies are not designed to hear in such environments. And although passengers were close to the sinking site, the Titanic still hit the bottom a long distance away, 12,500 feet. There are so many underwater landslides and earthquakes we cannot hear, and they make way more noise than a single ship slamming into the ocean floor. Most vibrations and sounds must have dispersed over a large area. Also, the down blast of water, which many believe hit the Titanic after it had touched the bottom of the ocean, would have pushed back the majority of the potential acoustic vibrations. Plus, the bottom of the ocean is not hard enough to produce such loud noises. Many survivors said they had heard terrifying noises as the Titanic was breaking apart, but none mentioned hearing anything after the ship disappeared below the surface of the water. Some survivors shared how chaotic it was when passengers, mainly women and children, were getting into lifeboats. There weren't enough boats, and still, some of them weren't even filled to their full capacity. No one knew how to react properly in such a situation. The lifeboat drill had been scheduled for the morning before the Titanic hit the iceberg, but for some reason, it got cancelled. A giant ocean liner everyone believes is unsinkable takes a trip across the ocean. On its way, it strikes an iceberg and sinks. Yeah, we all know how the story goes. But what's scary is that it's also the plot of The Wreck of the Titan, a novel published in 1898, 14 years before the Titanic went to the ocean bottom or was even constructed. In the novel, the Titan, what a scarily accurate name too, didn't have enough life jackets, vests, and lifeboats for all the passengers on board. It was also the largest ship of that time, almost identical in size to the Titanic, and both the Titan and Titanic sank in April. Dorothy Gibson was an American silent film actress. She was also one of the Titanic passengers. She survived the catastrophe. Right after she came to New York, she started filming Saved from the Titanic. The film was released only one month after the ship sank. Dorothy was even wearing the same shoes and clothes she had worn when she had actually been on the ship. The movie was successful, but it got destroyed in a fire, so it only exists in memories, like Jack Dawson. Titanic wasn't all alone in the restless waves of the cold ocean near the iceberg it struck. The SS Californian was relatively close. Their radio was shut off for that night, though. At one moment, the crew members noticed mysterious lights in the sky. They immediately went to wake their captain up to tell him, but he issued no orders. Some believed it was just fireworks. They never realized it was actually a call for help. The flares, crew members of the Titanic sent off to the sky, hoping someone would notice. By the time the SS Californian got the SOS message, it was already too late. Some say a full moon may have been the reason the iceberg crossed paths with the gigantic ship. A full moon may have caused incredibly strong tides that eventually sent multiple icebergs southward, right when the Titanic was crossing that area. Would you dare to taste cheese from the Titanic? The wreck has been under the ocean surface for more than 100 years now. It took more than 70 years to find it. By that time, most of the food that had gone down together with the ship had, of course, spoiled. But it's possible there's still some of it left. Some foods are protected from decay. For example, cheese. The microbes that turn milk into cheese create special conditions to protect the product from spoiling. Multiple things have survived the Titanic. A handwritten letter where a mother and a daughter wrote to the girl's grandma about the amazing journey they were on together. The letter has been around for more than 100 years and got sold at an auction. A battered pair of white cotton gloves was found in the wreck. Musicians on the Titanic played till the very last moment. Sheet music and one violin were found among the wreckage. The bell one of the crew members rang three times to warn there was a very close iceberg on their way. A pocket watch that stopped at 1.45 a.m., the time when the ship went under the water. Perhaps one person could have changed what happened on the Titanic. 
David Blair was a pretty lucky man. He was supposed to take the spot of the second officer of the Titanic. He was pulled out at the last moment, which eventually saved his life. It was a great thing for him, but something clouded his joy. What if he was the only person who could have done something to save the ship and the passengers? Back in the day, ships didn't have smart advanced technology like they do today. They couldn't see a threat on the horizon. Binoculars were pretty helpful, but the crew members on the Titanic didn't have access to the room where they were kept. David Blair was the man responsible for the keys. He left the ship in a hurry and forgot to hand over the keys that were in his pocket. Maybe if the crew members had had access to the binoculars, they would have seen the iceberg on time and had enough time to change course. It's possible that the giant iceberg that sent the Titanic to the ocean bottom was made of snow that had fallen in southwest Greenland. Scientists even used a computer model to calculate the paths the iceberg took in any given year, taking into consideration ocean currents and weather readings for that year. It's possible that the iceberg was 1,700 feet long, with a weight of around 75 tons. By the time it collided with the Titanic, it had dwindled down to only 1.5 tons. Violet Constance Jessup was, as many called her, Miss Unsinkable. She was only 24 years old when she joined the Titanic crew as a stewardess. On the tragic night when the ship struck the iceberg, she was lying in bed. As soon as she heard that something was going on, she got dressed and quickly went to the deck. Violet helped passengers get into lifeboats. Four years later, she was on the Britannic, the Titanic's sister ship. Once again, the ship started sinking. Not only did the woman survive another accident, but she was also once again the one helping other people to escape the vessel before it disappeared below the surface. The year was 1854, and the SS Arctic, the fastest passenger liner of its time, set out to cross the Atlantic. As it sailed through the misty veil, it slowly disappeared into the unknown. The Collins Line, an American shipping company, was started in 1818 and only began seriously trading in the transatlantic by 1835. Its steamships crossed the Atlantic from Liverpool to New York within just 10 days. Doesn't sound like a great speed today, I know, but back then, the same thing took other ships several weeks. Light on the water with their wooden hulls, powering through with a strong steam engine, those steamships were the favorite choice for many high-profile people. What could go wrong with such an advanced ship, they thought. This reminds me of some other ship everyone believed to be unsinkable. But anyway, back to the Collins Line. It grew to be a serious contender on transatlantic routes, with only one other competitor, the Cunard's Line. It was a British company also aiming to be the main force through the Arctic Passage. In 1835, the company received a new ship that traveled to Liverpool and came back to New York with the largest cargo ever at that time. From then, the Collins Line was steadily growing. It seemed like there would only be future successes for it. Unfortunately, their lavish ships became costly to run with the amount of coal used. Massive power along with weak wooden hulls meant they needed many repairs after each voyage. So, every trip ended up being expensive. But since the ships were safe and had a great reputation, people were willing to pay the price, and the company was definitely not in crisis. They had achieved something no one had managed to do before them. Like I told you, their ships crossed the Atlantic in a whopping 10 days, and Edward Collins, the owner, was very determined to maintain the pace. Their five ships easily outran the Cunard's line of only three. With this great praise, it provided more attention. Though the Cunard's ships were slower with their iron hulls, they believed there was still profit regardless of how slowly they sailed. Among Collins' ships, the Arctic, the third of them to be launched, was the largest, reaching 284 feet long with two side lever steam engines, each with 1,000 horsepower. The paddle wheels made 16 revolutions a minute when at full speed. At the time of its launch, the press called it the most stupendous vessel ever constructed in the United States. 
But glamour and fame couldn't avoid what would come next. On the 27th of September, the Arctic was on its journey from Liverpool to New York, continuing a speed pace through the thick fog. It's possible that by that moment, after four years of record-breaking trips, the crew became overconfident with their sailing and the ship. Going only 50 miles from Newfoundland, they carelessly continued through the fog with no radio contact, sonar, or any other form of identifying objects, equipped only with Morse code. A smaller ship, the SS Vesta, which operated as a fishing vessel, often worked around Newfoundland. It was passing through the same path as the Arctic and crashed into its side. Shocked by the collision, the captain of the Arctic offered help to the much smaller Vesta, but it was soon clear that the damage that seemed minor on the Arctic was far worse. Beneath the waterline, a hole was letting water into the hull. The cost of the much faster wooden hull now seemed less valuable. They steered toward land, trying to plug the holes, but they weren't doing so well, and the seawater continued to pour in, filling up higher and pushing the ship down. And finally, once the engine room was full, it put out the boilers, taking away the massive power the Arctic was once legendary for. They moved slowly until coming to a complete stop. The ship continued to sink, and the order was to abandon it. At the time, maritime law allowed for the Arctic to carry only six lifeboats, only capable of saving 180 people. The crew and some of the passengers managed to push their way aboard and took most of the seats on those boats. Things were pretty wild, and everyone forgot about their manners, not letting the ladies and the youngest ones board first. It took four hours for the Arctic to sink. 150 crew and 250 passengers were on board. Those that weren't able to find a lifeboat made a desperate attempt to build their own rafts from parts of the ship. Two days later, only three boats made it safely to the shore. The other three were never found. Believe it or not, the rescue party also saved some people that had been clinging to the wreckage for two days. Unlike the crew, the captain went down with the Arctic, but amazingly survived. He would be only one of 85 people that made it out of the 400 on board. When the news arrived two weeks later, the public responded with great sadness to the losses. Great anger soon followed towards the poor safety measures in the crew. The press published demands to change the laws for more lifeboats. It only made sense to have enough for every person on board a ship. But they ignored those requests. This neglect would lead to more disasters in the future. Enough lifeboats would only come into maritime law some 60 years later, after the disaster of the Titanic. Edward Collins' wife and two children were also aboard the ship and didn't return. He was heartbroken, but didn't stop running his business. The Collins line still had a reputation to uphold, the biggest, fastest, and most luxurious on the Atlantic. Edward Collins would now build an even better ship than any other. It was named the Adriatic, and it was the largest ship in the world, 354 feet long. With two alternating steam engines that had never been built of this size. These steam engines at the time were at the height of engineering, though today you can only see them in models and toys. With the new addition of two masts, the Adriatic would also be able to sail if needed. Luckily, they made some lessons from the disaster of the Arctic. But before their new ship, the Adriatic, was built, another disaster had occurred. The sister ship of the Arctic had also sunk. They believe this second ship was desperate to stay in front of the Cunard's line and hit an iceberg somewhere during the race. This weird contest took the lives of 141 people. The desperation of Collins and his weakly built hulls pushed the company towards bankruptcy in 1858. The newly built Adriatic, costing over $1 million, had only made one voyage in the end. And even that voyage was considered a disaster. The ship collided with a tugboat. It still managed to finish its maiden voyage at a suitable time. After the company had gone bankrupt, 
They had to sell the ship for only $50,000. They removed the great giant engines, replacing them with only sails. Although it was once the greatest ship on the high seas, it was only 30 years later until it was abandoned, labeled irreparable and anchored in a river. The other remaining ships were also sold and only used for parts. Edward Collins left the industry altogether, seeking work on dry land instead. As the Collins line was no longer in the mix, the Cunards would grow in strength. Without competition, they would win the Blue Ribbon for the next 30 years, and 180 years later, after producing hundreds of ships. They still have a constant presence on the seas as they provide transatlantic crossings, world voyages, and leisure cruises. To this day, the Cunard Line is the only one to run ships between Europe and America, and it's great proof that it's not always the fastest that's the best. <laughs>